Whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance. That's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this podcast. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System, you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. At hundreds of locations across the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash bluewire to learn more and find a center near you. That's U-N-I-F-Y-D healing.com slash bluewire. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including EE system. Your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis, James Fegan, and Josh Nelson. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to a special edition Sox Machine Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Nelson, and this episode previews the 2024 NCAA baseball postseason with regional tournaments starting this weekend. Not only is this a fun weekend with games starting at 11 a.m. Central Time and ending around 11 p.m., but it's an opportunity for fans to see how upcoming draft prospects fare before July's draft. And who doesn't love the atmosphere of the College World Series? Join the Sox Machine podcast to help us preview the NCAA postseason is the co-host of Power Alley, which you can listen to on the MLB Network Radio and also contributes to the college sports station on Sirius XM. He recently called the ACC tournament for ESPN and will be calling the Tucson Regional this upcoming weekend. It's our good friend, Mike Farron. And Mike, welcome back to the Sox Machine podcast. It's great to see you. It's great to be back with you. Um, you know, I always love talking ball with you because I know you do your homework and you're you're as well resourced as anybody. So this is gonna be fun because we get to talk some college ball, which is like my other passion outside of major league baseball. My two favorite sports, major league baseball, and college baseball. And then yeah. third is high school players for the draft. <laughs> well, so this past weekend you called the ACC tournament, and there's just so much going on, like for me. So pulling the curtain back, podcast listeners, I'm flipping back and forth the ACC and the SEC tournament because when it comes to college players, the White Sox have spent a lot of time, obviously, at Wake Forest because of Winston-Salem makes it really easy. If you're going to go check on White Sox players with the dash, you can go catch a game over the weekend if the Demon Deacons are in town. So watching Chase Burns, watching Nick Kurtz, then flipping it over to the SEC tournament and seeing Hagen Smith only pitching two innings. Like there's a lot going back and forth for me, but Mike, you were in Charlotte for the ACC tournament. You called a great game, especially between Wake Forest and North Carolina, watching those schools and those players, because there's so many prospects with this upcoming draft coming from the ACC. What were your initial, or I guess, what's your recap? What are your thoughts after calling that tournament? Well, I mean, first that game that you referenced that Friday night extra inning game that, that um, wake ended up winning nine to five was one of the best baseball games that you'll ever see. And not just because it was exciting late, but because the superstars all performed right. Chase Burns goes out, punches out 15 and six shutout innings. Uh, You know, Vance Honeycutt, the center fielder for North Carolina, Smashes a game time two run double or RBI double also makes this incredible catch in center field. Nick Kurtz ties the game in the bottom of the ninth or, or the top of the ninth, excuse me, with a an RBI double. Uh, I'm going down to their last strike and then wins it with an opposite field homer that hit off the scoreboard. Like I know that that truest uh, field is a um, is a pretty. 
uh, good hitters ballpark, but holy cow, was that ridiculous, right? Like the fact that it was only marked at 408, I think they need to go out and remeasure because it was unbelievable. <laughs> um, and so you got in like even Steven Seaver King, who was a guy that you didn't mention um, in there as a potential first rounder, made a sensational defensive play for Wake and Casey Cook, who I think is probably going to end up being probably a late day one pick or early day two out of North Carolina, had a big game. So it was awesome seeing the stars show. And so that was really, really cool um you know the general takeaway for me is the same on on the acc this year and I've, I've spent more time doing acc games than any other conference this season and the talent level is super high um this is you know as much as like last year was a banner year for the sec in terms of overall talent and it's still the best league in america the acc is just slightly behind it and in terms of draftable talent at least high-end draft talent they're almost in lockstep with them. Um, you know, I think the two guys at Florida State and, and James Tibbs and Cam Smith are super exciting players. Um, you know, Tibbs is going to be one of those guys that is a, a really high floor offensive machine. Uh, Cam Smith has a higher ceiling, but probably a little bit more risk to him, too, as a right handed hitting third baseman who actually is can run a little bit. And I'm just talking to one scouting director who liked him and thought maybe right field would be his ultimate spot. But, mm. um, you know, like I thought that was a really interesting conversation. Um, you know, there's guys for the 25 draft like Cam Canarella at Clemson and Jamie Arnold of Florida State, their yeah. Friday starter, who is like um, kind of like this undersized low slot lefty who um, can run it up to 96 and has the high vert fastball. And um, so it was just I mean, it was loaded with talent overall. Um, and that makes the games fun, even when the games weren't super close. Like, I think the only star that we really didn't see was Jonathan Santucci for Duke, who's been coming back from a rib cage injury, but it sounds like he's going to be good to go for regional. So that's certainly good news for them. So when watching Chase Burns, yeah, somebody that I've been covering a lot on Sox Machine, especially for those our listeners that have been following along with the 2024 MLB draft reports. What are your thoughts about Burns? Because in that particular start against North Carolina, we had StatCast data yeah. with Burns for the first time making it public, and he's hitting 100 miles per hour, like all of the data that we've been receiving. So cap tip to the Wake Forest analytics department for the baseball squad has been accurate. And it it's really hard to deny the type of talent, especially arm talent that Burns has. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, I mean, listen, he – made a little bit of a mechanical adjustment right before the season started that allowed the fastball to play better at the top of the zone. Um, and it's a really good heater and, you know, and it touches a hundred. It's a different fastball than Hagen Smith. It's even a different one than Paul Skeens a year ago. It has more swing and miss properties to it. And I think then certainly than what Skeens had. Um, and so I think that's really interesting. I think, you know, in talking to some evaluators, I think there is some concern that the breaking ball maybe doesn't play quite as well in pro ball um, because I, I think guys are just better hitters, but I mean, like you have to get started really early to get ready for a hundred and that lets it play up. And that's not to say that his breaking ball is bad. It's pretty good. Um, you know, he's really got, you know, two breakers that he can use and he's got the fastball. He doesn't really use the change up very much, um, but he doesn't have to either. I mean, he can just dominate with those pitchers. I think there's definitely reliever risk with chase Burns, but you know, he'll either be the first or second pitcher off the board. And I expect he'll go comfortably somewhere in the top 10 and, uh, may not be on the board by the time the White Sox pick at six, right? White Sox are at six, five. So the five. So yeah, I mean, there's a chance that either he or Hagen Smith are gone. But um, you know, listen, like I think, I think it for me at least, the top of the draft is very risky when it comes to arms. It's less risky when it comes to bats. And this is just uh, a little bit of a conservative viewpoint on it, because I think, you know, if, if a pitcher gets hurt, like you might have nothing, if a bat gets hurt, you probably got a role player. Right. So right. Um, I think that there's, I think there's probably some risk there, but man, Burns is good and he's fun and he's fiery. And, uh, you know, I know we're going to talk about the NCAA tournament in a little bit, but um, if wake wins their regional, they're paired up with Knoxville, which is where he transferred from. Yep. And so the idea of chase Burns going back and going head to head with the t against Tennessee, like get your popcorn ready for that. Cause if that happens, it's going to be epic. Yeah. It'll be electric. The thing about like Burns, the more I watch him, 
I'm not a big fan. Like, he likes to steal strike one with this type of high slider. So I could understand from a pro scouting perspective, yeah, that's going to go 400 feet at guarantee rate field. Like, you can't flip that slider because it just hangs up at the top part mm-hmm. of the zone. Professional hitters will crush you on that. Uh, but I, I wonder if he, if, it, if another team picks him up and they install, like, either a cutter or a sweeper action to pair up with this four-seamer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I do think... He's not maxed out. Velocity-wise, he's probably maxed out. But I still think you'd be pretty creative in, in what you could do with Chase mm-hmm. Burns. From a White Sox perspective, I would be scared if Cleveland took Chase Burns first overall. <laughs> It'd be incredibly risky, but the track record the Cleveland Guardians have with right-handed pitchers and developing them, uh, that would not be a good sign from a White Sox perspective. Because well, I'm sure he would, he would excel yeah. with Cleveland. Yeah, it would be a little bit of a stretch to see them take a pitcher 1-1 because they have not, I mean, one, they haven't drafted at the top of the draft very often, but two, right. they have tended to go, um, especially young prep players. That's been, they've been one of those teams that is really, it feels like has modeled heavily towards middle of the field prep players who are young for their age. There's not a great fit for that here. Um, you know, I think if you're going to pick a draft to cut a deal, this is the draft to do it because, you know, Burns and Smith are putting together these incredible seasons and Charlie Condon at, at Georgia, you know, is going to end up with close to 40 home runs. And, um, you know, the, the Travis Pizana is really good. Like, it's just, I mean, I don't know how you slug 900 in Corvallis. Like that's, I know the pack wasn't quite as good this year, but like, you know, like as much as we're all, we're all drooling over Condon's performance in Athens at university of Georgia, that's a way better hitting environment than, than playing in the rain in Corvallis. Um, and Bazana's forearms look like lead pipes. Like they're just massive. Like I think he's got a chance to be a really, really good player. I mean, th- there's all these guys that are at the top that are super interesting, but they're not that much different than kind of that next group. I mean, we, we keep talking about it. It's like, there's 11 guys that are kind of the top 11 in some order and maybe Condon's the best of it, but he, he's not the best by a wide margin. So if you're going to play the game early on, especially if you're Cleveland or Cincinnati that has this pool money, you know, this is the year to kind of cut a deal in that spot and, and be able to, to um, you know, be able to pass the savings into to some other spots where you can get some college bats a little bit later that are still, still have a chance to be quality. The only pick by the White Sox that would ruin my draft night and having White Sox fans come at me with pitchforks and torches, Mike, is if we hear with the fifth overall pick, the Chicago White Sox select Wake Forest first baseman, Nick Kurtz. White Sox fans do not have (laughs) the appetite right now for another college first baseman Uh, with the top five pick with the struggles that Andrew Vaughn is currently going through. Little different player. Yeah, a a little different physically. Yeah, yeah, much taller. Uh, Nick Kurtz is a true six five first baseman. Mm, Probably more athletic. But when I watch Kurtz, though, like this is the film I watched against NC State. And if you look at his lines, it's a good series. It's a lot of walks. But the thing that I watched in the NC State, and Wake Forest really needed to win that series at the end of the season, and they lost the Chase Burns start, was Kurtz had opportunities early in the count to drive the ball, but he's so focused sometimes, and maybe a little too focused, that I'm wondering if he's a little too passive at the plate and not attacking pitches early in the zone. Then I watch him in that North Carolina game, and when he's locked in and he knows what he's what's coming at him, yeah, then he gets aggressive. So this is where I'm like conflicted here. I don't know what kind of hitter Nick Kurtz is going to be professionally. He's got a good batter's eye. It's twice as many walks as strikeouts. It's a crazy walk total. But as we've seen with White's, the White Sox have gone in, down this route in the past with like Zach Collins taking guys who had good walk rates in the college game, but they become professionals and opposing teams find out you can't hurt me. And then all of a sudden you're not walking anymore. What are your vibes or what are your thoughts about Kurtz? Yeah, I mean, so I think the difference to me in Kurtz and those guys is that he's a better athlete, first and foremost. I mean, Collins, I always like Collins power, but. 
Um, you know, I think a lot of what he w- was doing was tied to whether or not he could catch. And I think there was some skepticism of that coming out of college. Um, you know, Vaughn is undersized, right? An undersized right, right first baseman who really hasn't hit for power. And I think that's the difference is that you're talking about a guy with with prodigious power and a really, really good approach. And I don't find him to be as passive as, as you know, you've talked about. Now, you've been locked in on a bats in a different way than I ha- I am, but you know, like between making, you know, one pitcher work to get the three, two pitch that he wanted and sitting off speed um, and crushing a game time double to the next time up, knowing that they'd been starting him with fastballs. It's literally what he told his post game. Yeah. I knew that they'd been starting with fastball. So I was on it and torching it. I mean, those are, those are professional approaches. He's also a dynamite defender at first and athletic Mm -hmm. enough that he could play the outfield. Um, So, I mean, it's a little different, but I think the bigger point is one that extends not just to the White Sox and Kurtz, but to the draft in general. And, and part of what makes this draft, I don't, I don't think this is a bad draft. I think it's a beautifully flawed draft because there's just no middle of the field players at the top. Everybody we're talking about is, you know, uh, a corner guy, right. Or a pitcher. And so we're not, there's no center fielders that are at the top of the draft. There are no shortstops that are at the top of the draft. There's no catchers that are at the top of the draft, right? These are all corner guys or second baseman. And that's a really weird profile to try and play on. Right. And so I think that's part of, you know, when you get stuck in that fifth spot, like, I think Kurtz is kind of a difference maker, but I also understand the concern with like, hey, are we really going to take a first baseman here at five? I think that's kind of always the case, right? Like look at the high profile first baseman that we've seen taken in the top half of the first round over the last, what, you know, five or six years, right? Like how many of them have actually panned out? I mean, you mentioned Vaughn Torkelson's been inconsistent. He was one, one Paven Smith has not been a consistent regular. You know, he was number seven overall. I think Nick Prado was in the first half of that draft, right? Like there's a lot of guys that weren't because there's just not any other place for them to go. And, you know, as one GM kind of told me, if you're taking these guys that don't necessarily have ceilings at, at first base, it's like, there aren't generally like the backup, like the 45 grade first baseman, right? Like you're either an up and down guy or you're a regular. Yeah. And so I think it makes it a little bit tougher in that regard. Now I'm, I'm pretty well convicted on Kurtz. I like him quite a bit, but I, I certainly understand where your trepidation would come from. And I'm not sure that based on the white Sox needs that, you know, drafting a corner guy is going to make the most sense there, even though we know that this is a draft that's filled with corner guys near the top. Yeah, White Sox fans would be incredibly upset. The New York Yankees would not hesitate to draft Nick Kurtz. They, Nick Kurtz is a Yankee. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, he's probably in Oakland A. I mean, I think that in the end, I think you're I mean, right. That's like, yeah, that's the like guy that like that's the rumor that just won't stop is that like Kurtz yeah. is going to go to the the Kurtz and the A's are there. But I mean, I, again, like a lot of it depends on what happens ahead and. Um, you know, I think that there are some college bats that are going to jump into the top 10 that you don't expect. You know, I mentioned Dave, James Tibbs before, like yeah. James Tibbs, the third is the perfect kind of guy that, that jumps up because of the, the, um, plate discipline, right. And the, the floor is really high. I think Braden Montgomery ends up going pretty high, right. You've got a switch hitter who's cleaned up his right-handed swing and has power from both sides. If you want to cut a deal, you know, JJ Weatherholt is healthy, now, after dealing with a hamstring injury all year, I mean, he was one of the top players in the draft coming in. I mean, you could probably still take him in one of those spots and take a little bit of savings and spend it somewhere else. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of possibilities that are out there um, for teams that are picking near the top, whether it's one or two or, or at five. Yeah, if, if this was a free-for-all, like, Kurtz to the Yankees makes so much sense. But if Kurtz gets selected by Oakland, watch in three years, Oakland trades Kurtz to the New York Yankees. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can see that happening. You mentioned JJ Weatherhold. So let's talk about the NCAA regionals, which starts this weekend. And again, uh, every team's trying to find either three or four wins. There's the winner's bracket. There's the loser's bracket. It's an incredibly fun weekend of baseball that is coming up. Mike, you have one of my favorite regionals that you'll be calling for ESPN, and that is the Tucson Regional. And the reason why this is one of my favorite regionals. So the number one seed is the Arizona Wildcats. The number two seed is Dallas Baptist. Third seed is West Virginia. And fourth seed is Grand Canyon, which 
in a way, this also kind of serves as a home series for them along with Arizona. And you just have, I think you have three really good programs in this regional with Arizona, Dallas Baptist and West Virginia. So break it down for us. Like, what are you paying attention to and what do you think is going to be the key to success and who survives the Tucson regional? Yeah. I mean, and you're playing in a place that's historically a really good hitters environment, right? Like in, in Tucson, I mean, high Corbett field, which is probably uh, most famous as being the spring training home for Cleveland back when major league was filmed is a pretty good offensive ballpark. And so you feel like it's going to be offensive. Um, Now that said, no team has thrown more strikes in the country this year than Arizona has. Uh, Chip Hale, their head coach, the former Diamondbacks manager, who's a longtime major league coach and was a star at UVA, is in his third year running the program. And he saw Wake Forest last year to lead the nation in ERA and said, well, why can't we do that? Because the, like where Wake Forest plays, like it's – it's about 72 feet to center field, right? Like it's tiny, right? So, so they revamp their pitching program and they have three excellent starters. Jackson Kent, who's a Chicago area kid, um, has struggled a little bit down the stretch, but really it stabilized on Fridays. Clark Candiotti, who's the the son of Tom Candiotti, uh, the former knuckleballer, uh, throws a lot harder than his dad ever did. Um, and, and has on his fifth school in five years has really clicked. And then Cam Walty, who is a former, um, first team all Mountain West performer at uh, at Nevada and is in his second year at Arizona has really been their best pitcher statistically. And, you know, all these guys have thrown 80 plus innings this year. So it's kind of unique that they have a little bit of an old school look there. They're not the best offensive team. And Mason White, who's their shortstop, is going to be a guy that we'll talk a lot about for next year's draft, um, has had a great year where he's hit 19 homers, but it's not as offensive a group as you would expect. And I think that kind of extends beyond the rest of it. Dallas Baptist is the team that I think most people probably aren't familiar with. It should be. This is their ninth consecutive regional. Um, They have built an incredible program. Dan Hefner, who's the head coach there, was an assistant for Rick Heller, who's now at Iowa, at Northern Iowa years and years ago when, when there was still a baseball program in Cedar Falls. He's done a marvelous job. I mean, that, that's that's a nine straight regionals, 10 in the last 11 years. And since he's been there, he's taken that team to two supers. Um, they're, they're a really good program with Ryan Johnson anchoring the rotation. He is outstanding. He's a potential day one pick this year. And Grant Jay is a power hitting catcher. And then you mentioned Weatherhold. West Virginia is one of the more interesting teams. Randy Mazey, their head coach, is retiring after the season. Uh, they are uh, they have the look of a team that can run some some points on you really quickly. Whether Holt is a dynamic presence who's been playing through this hamstring issue for the most part this year. He's back playing the field defensively. Speed is a big part of his game. We'll have to see whether or not it plays out in the desert. Um, and then Grand Canyon was kind of the one that, you know, it's like three really good programs, but I would put Grand Canyon in that mix because they've won the WAC four straight years. Um, you know, they were transitioned from, from uh, division. I think it were NAIA actually before they tra- transferred into division one. Um, they've been to the tournament three straight years. Now they got in because Tarleton state won the WAC tournament, uh, but wasn't eligible yet for the postseason because they're also transitioning from division two. And so as the regular season champs, Grand Canyon gets in there, they are loaded with the sons of former big leaguers. So Tyler Wilson is the son of um, you know, former Cubs lefty, Steve Wilson. He was the WAC player of the year this year. So Gucci's son is on the team. Uh, like there's like a ton of these guys that just have big league bloodlines. Heifer's kids are nephews of Ben Zobrist, right? Like Zobrist played at Dallas Baptist. So there, there's a lot of talent that's there overall. Um, and it's going to be intense because I, I think what makes a really good regional is having a four seed that nobody wants to see. Yeah. And Grand Canyon is that four seed that nobody wants to see. And like the last time they played Arizona, they boat raced them. They beat them 24 to eight. Now, granted, that was in a midweek game. And if you're not familiar with college baseball, the pitching in midweeks is developmental. Let's say it's closer to um, just trying to get some guys some work to see what you have. Whereas most of the best pitchers are saved for the weekend. But I mean, that's a lot of runs scored against an Arizona team that pitched really well this year. Yeah, the other region that will be, I'll be paying attention to is Clemson. Mm. So you got one seed Clemson, two seed Vanderbilt. 
three C Coastal Carolina and Gary Gilmore is retiring after this season. So just like West Virginia, like the last hurrah motivation is a thing when it comes to postseason college baseball, like adds more motivation to everybody on the team and and high point as well. Like Clemson's got a very dangerous regional. I thought uh, (laughs) they could have, they could have drew a little bit better, but those are the two regions and I'm glad because I love the way that you call games, Mike, I'm glad that you got the Tucson regional and those games are going to be at night. Uh, three o'clock, nine o'clock, as long as, uh, well, I should say as long as weather holds up, but that's a sh- more of a Chicago thing this time around when it comes to all the rain that we've been getting so far in the month of May. But outside of those two regionals, of course, there's 16 total regionals, but here's a question I have for you, Mike, our picks to click, which schools are you most confident in will not only survive regionals when they're super regional and make make it to Omaha because I think like gauging other writings from other pundits and people who cover college baseball, there's just not like a ton of confidence right now in certain programs that could survive the regionals and super regionals and like book it. This school will be in yeah. Omaha. Are there any schools for you that you are most confident can reach Omaha? I mean, I would say Arkansas, but. You know, they're pat- paired up with the, the Charlottesville Regional at University of Virginia. Mississippi State has been playing unbelievably well. They're the two seed they there. Have. And so you could end up with an Arkansas, Mississippi State, you know, all SEC Super Regional, which would be actually pretty exciting in Fayetteville. I mean, that would be a great environment. And, and Mississippi State just went there and won a series. Mm-hmm. So I think I, that's a really interesting matchup. I think that, that would be, um, you know, so I would say Arkansas kind of, I think Tennessee – um, you know, them pairing up against Wake, I think those are both Omaha caliber squads. Um, it's not easy if you have to face Chase Burns. And, you know, Josh Hartle, I think, has pitched better than the results, at least when I've seen him. Uh, it's kind of been like he's been that guy where it's like there's an error and then the the, the snowball rolls downhill, right, and you can't really stop it. Um, and so I think he's probably due for a little bit better luck at some point. So that makes it tougher for me to say on, on Tennessee. Um, you know, those are kind of the ones I would say have the best chances. Maybe Texas A&M. That's a pretty complete team. The top of their lineup is really good. Gavin Grohovic, the freshman, Jace Lavalette, the, the sophomore, and and Braden Montgomery, who we just talked about, the, the junior, the transfer from Stanford, are as potent a one, two, three as there is in the country. A&M's been near the top of the country in, in ERA for most of the year. Um, you know, listen, they've got Texas in their regional, so you know it's going to be crazy good. Um, and Santa Barbara looms for them, which is an, a, a team that is capable of getting to Omaha. They have probably as deep a rotation as anybody. Um, and they're more physical and offensive. I think the more people than most people realize Aaron Parker, their catcher is, um, a, he's been bothered by a knee injury this year. So he hasn't run, but he's kind of like out of that JT real Muto mold or J- Jason Kendall is probably a better comp for him, um, okay. of a catcher that kind of hits at the top of the order and runs, um, like I think that's a really intriguing matchup, but I would feel decent about AM's chances. So, and and like I think like, there are a number of teams that I think are really good. Like I think North Carolina is really good, but if you end up with a North Carolina Arizona Super, like that's Arizona's pitching is a little bit deeper than UNC's. I think that would actually be a really fascinating matchup. You know, I have a few concerns about Clemson. I think Oklahoma State is one of the more underrated teams right now this is the first time and this might be the best pitching group that josh holiday's had in his time at the at at the helm at at oklahoma state and as he's the younger brother of matt holiday um they're really good on the mound they have carson bench who's a terrific two-way player who's going to go well in the draft nobody's quite sure if it's going to be as a pitcher or an outfielder might as well let him do both uh nolan schubert who's the detroit area kid is a huge power hitter for them like they have real talent there. So it's tough for me to assess because I think they're pretty close a lot, but I guess I would say Arkansas probably won. And then just kind of backing up from that, I would say Oklahoma state, their path looks like it's, it's pretty good. I like where they're, they're matched up to, I think they can handle if it's Clemson or Vanderbilt, whoever comes out of that regional and also holiday used to be an assistant at Vanderbilt. So if you end up with Vandy at, uh, against Oklahoma state, that would be pretty interesting too. I'm sure Josh holidays, Asking his brother, Matt, how come my nephews don't play for me? <laughs> I mean, he's got a With, chance at the next one. Um, you know, 
I think Ethan's probably going to go one, one in 25 or close to it, but you never know. Maybe he decides he wants to go play for uncle Josh. (laughs) Josh goes to the athletic director at Oklahoma state. Hey, look at our recruiting rate. Yeah. It's like, Hey, we we keep getting these recruits. I just wish we could get them to campus. We need to up our NIL. You know, it's funny too. It's like, I don't know people know this, but their dad, Tom holiday is like one of the legendary pitching coaches of the last 30 years in college baseball and was a coach at, at, he actually coached there with Frank Anderson, who was Brett Anderson's dad. And Frank is now the pitching coach at Tennessee. Um, Tom does color for the digital broadcast for Oklahoma state. He's great. Like it's really fun. It's a, it's a total holiday family affair in Stillwater. I'm glad you mentioned Texas A&M for our podcast listeners. And I'll write more about this Thursday morning when it gets published uh, the one player to follow for each of the schools, 64 players that you could follow during the opening round and throughout the postseason for MOP draft purposes. I got Texas A&M winning the whole thing. Uh, I think this has been such an offensive season, Mike. And I know I, I've done a poor job, podcast listeners. Like I, I'm not highlighting this because I don't know what's real or not. But we have seen a crazy amount of offense in this college yeah. season, a crazy amount of home runs. And there was a joke online. I forgot who tweeted it out, and I wish I remembered it. But it was, if you do not have a new single-season home run record leader yeah. for your program this year, you did something wrong because so many home run records are being yeah. broken. And that path for Texas A&M, they are almost impossible to beat at home. That is maybe, would you say Texas A&M is the best home environment in college baseball? It's got to be up there. No, I mean, I think, I mean, Listen, no, I love Olsen Field and it's great to go to, but I don't think that anything in terms of environment, I think the dude is it and Starkville. You know, I think yeah, that Starkville or too. Alec Box and in in Shreveport, two places that aren't actually hosting this year, those would be the, the picks that I would have. But Kyle Field's awesome. I mean, it's like the the experience one, or not Kyle Field, Olsen Field. So, you know there's an old saying about Olsen field magic, right? That late in the game, Texas A&M has this history of coming back and you kind of feel like there's always this little bit of a mist there that, that makes you feel like it's possible. The best thing that their fans do is that if a pitcher walks somebody on four pitches, they start chanting ball five ball five, and then ball six, and that will keep going and it will get louder and louder and louder and more disruptive. So it is a great environment, but I don't know. It's the best one. I'm not sure it's even the best one in their conference, but it's close. Like it's, it's a place like when you think of places like, you know, college station and, you know, Baton Rouge and you think of um, Starkville, you know, you think of these places that are SEC schools, Oxford, you know, those are places that just have Fayetteville, unbelievable environment surrounding them. And I think there's some of that in the ACC too. I mean, I think, um, you know, I used to go to a lot of games in Charlottesville when I lived in, in DC. I loved the environment there. I think Boschmer at, at, at NC in North Carolina is one of those spots. I think Florida State, Dick Hauser can be one of yes. those spots too. So I think there's, you know, there are certainly a ton of good environments, but the top of the list to me is it's it's the dude and everybody's playing for second. Yeah, that, that home field environment though is going to be such a huge benefit, especially for the SEC schools, the super regional. That's why for podcast yeah. listeners, if you skip the regionals, you skip super regionals. I, I hope that you don't, but if you then pay attention to the college world series and it's like, why are there so many sec teams? Well, one quality, but two, I think half of them are going to be hosting super regional. So they got home field advantage in that three game yeah. series. So that plays a big factor. Do you got a sleeper team? You got a sleeper that can maybe make it to Omaha that nobody's thinking of. Well, I mean, I think the Santa Barbara count is that. I mean, I think they're one of them. Yeah, I nobody's really talking sleeper. about them. I mean, I think that's a team that is. I mean, I think you know, it's weird to call the number two overall seed a sleeper, but I think Kentucky is one. Although you know, they did not get done any favors by the committee by having Indiana State in their region. Yeah. Uh, you know, Indiana State, I felt like for all the, the consternation that always comes with selection shows and selection Monday in baseball, I felt like Indiana State was the one that really got jobbed you know, when it comes to being a host, like they were a top 10 RPI team all year. They've won 19 consecutive Valley series. Um, they lost in the conference tournament, you know, like that's, that is going to happen. It's baseball. We all know that, right? Like it's, it's, it's tough to win every day when you play every day. 
So I think they're a, a sleeper for it. I mean, outside of that, I mean, does Duke count as a sleeper? I think that team's mm-hmm. pretty good. You know, like to me, it's North Carolina, Duke, and Wake are the best, the best in that conference. Um, you know, I think those are probably ones would come up, and I think Arizona too. I, I really like Arizona's team a lot. Um, you know, the big difference is that you know, we're going to go from these smaller environments to we're going to get to Omaha, and um, it's the complete opposite, right? The the way the field was designed, it was designed with the the older bats uh, in mind. And so the wind blows in off the river. And when it's warm, it knocks the ball down and what's already a huge ballpark with a ton of foul territory. And so, you know, the question is like, can you get to Omaha? Then what is your offense able to do there? Or how are you able to manufacture runs? And I think that's a real key. So, um, you know, I think some of those teams are good ones that are kind of sleepers to get to Omaha. I realize that most of them are kind of top seeds, I don't know that unless you're like Florida who's super talented, there's a three seed or something like that, or an Oral Roberts from a year ago that really stands out to me that can make that kind of a run all the way to to Omaha. Yeah, I got Coastal Carolina as my sleeper. They played so well in the first half. They really stubbed their toe in the second half. Yeah, They barely got in. Barely got in. But that happened to Ole Miss. And Ole yeah. Miss won the whole damn thing a couple of years ago. White Sox first baseman. Tim yeah, but Elko. they don't have Tim Elko. <laughs> Tim like Elko. that's the problem is that the Coastal doesn't have Tim Elko. Yeah. So speaking of Elko, swinging this back to the White Sox, I'm trying to sell the idea, Mike, that this postseason for the NCAA is important for White Sox fans to watch, not just because the entertainment value and White Sox fans deserve to watch some entertaining baseball, which has not <laughs> always been the case this season but a chance to see some players who could be taken in July's draft and players to hope on because with each passing week, this draft gains more importance for the White Sox since they will not have a top 10 pick next year. Yeah. I think that that's, I think it's, um, I think it's a good point. I mean, I think especially with as deep as the draft is in college bats and arms, I mean, really this is the best collection of college arms we've had in a while. Um, I think it's, it's going to be, if you want to get in on the ground floor of what the next, you know, the next couple of years of the White Sox minor leagues are going to look like, I think that, yeah, it's absolutely a great jumping off point. Um, And I think there's enough talent there either here or for the 25 draft that could be in play, you know, around pick 10, which is probably where they're going to end up picking, um, you know, that, that it's worth kind of getting in uh, and getting a look at them early. Um, I think last year we had what 11 of the top 39 picks were in Omaha. I don't know that we're going to have 11 again, but there's going to be a lot of them. And the fact that all of these games are available to you either, you know, on ESPN plus or any of the ESPN networks or, um, you know, the best way to watch it is really with squeeze play, which is like, imagine like NFL red zone, but uh, only for baseball and starting at noon and ending at midnight, you know, like it's, this is real, like redefine the butt groove on your couch, kind of what viewing the next couple of days, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and you don't miss any of the action. So you get to see the at-bats, you get to see these players, you get to start making your own opinions on them. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's pivotal. I mean, if you're, if you're interested in, you know, where the future of the White Sox are, I think there's probably going to be, you know, I would say more than five players that are playing in this tournament that, that will end up in their system, you know, and I might be really light on that, but it's, this is not a good high school draft. It's going to be about the college players for the most part. And you're going to get to see so many of them. I think it's 20 of the 25 golden spikes awards. Semifinalists are playing and the top eight players on most of the draft boards. Like that's, yes, that's pretty incredible. Um, So yeah, it's a great chance for you to see it. And, you know, just as an aside is a big, bigger pitch. The college baseball is really fun. Like the, the pitch timer, I think has had a more positive impact on, on college baseball, even than it did on major league baseball in that we don't have these four and a half hour slogs anymore. Yeah. And college baseball is fun because there is greater variety. You know, major league baseball is a power game, which is cool. Like I have no problems with the way the game has evolved there, 
But like, if you want to go watch Kentucky, which can run the ball out of the ballpark, but also is going to run the bases and take it by pitches and, uh, you know, bunt as an offensive weapon, not just to give away outs. Like those teams are really fun. Santa Barbara can do that as well. Oklahoma, like they literally call their offense chaos. Reggie Willits is their hitting coordinator, the former big league outfielder. And in fact, his son is their shortstop as a freshman. He's a really good player. Jackson, his younger brother is supposed to be better. Um, but they are, you know, they call it chaos because they are just, they run the bases. They, you know, crazy hit and runs. They'll bunt, they'll move the ball around and they can run it out of the ballpark too. Um, Wofford's one of those interesting four seeds. If you get a chance to see them, they're, they're, their former head coach is now at Boston College, Todd Iterdonato, but they're, they have the same players that are there and they probably will try and steal. Um, they will probably have four to five stolen base attempts a game. Like that's, that's what Wofford does. And so it's very unsettling um, for other teams. So the variety is a great part of uh, what makes college baseball cool. And as somebody who likes to watch, you know, like I like to watch guys hit tanks. I love the pull side Homer, like who doesn't yeah. right. Like really when it's all sudden done, it's like, let's go. But at the same time, man, there's a lot of different ways to score runs in college baseball. It makes it more fun. And the players aren't as perfect, which is also kind of cool. And then finally, to put on your power alley cap, and oh, I'm boy. a little afraid to ask, but I will anyways. Mike, what are your thoughts about the Chicago White Sox so far in 2024? Like, from a national perspective, how do you guys talk about this White Sox team? They're not very good. <laughs> I mean, I, think that's, that's, I don't really have anything other than that. I, they're, I'll be honest, they're worse than I thought they were going to be. I mean, I thought they were going to – I was buying into – hey, at least they're going to be a better defensive club. That'll help. And it just has not been the case, right? Like they just have not – I mean, there's not enough offense there. Clearly, they don't have the right personnel, I don't think, to build a good offense um, as it stands right now. Like there's – I'm not sure who on this White Sox roster you look at offensively and go, man, they're going to be a key contributor on the next good White Sox team. You know, and I'm like, like I told you when they made the trade, like I love Dom Fletcher. I think Dom Fletcher is going to be a really good, like fourth outfielder in the big leagues, but like, okay. So you've got one and he's probably not an everyday guy. Right. So, you know, I think that's part of it. I think, um, Derek Crochet has been fantastic. That's been really fun to watch. Eric Fetty pitching as well as he has, has been fun to watch. Chris Flexen has had some moments, that I think are kind of interesting, but like, listen, they're in a position where it just doesn't feel like it's particularly close. And maybe, maybe that changes when, um, you know, like Colson Montgomery comes up and you start to get, you know, you know, Noah Schultz gets, you know, a little bit further along and you start to get some of these younger guys, Brian Ramos gets more playing time. Like, um, you know, is he, is he back now or is he, he about is to back, be back now, from injury? Yes. He just came back. Right. So like, okay. So there's one guy that maybe you can build around. We'll see the approach a little aggressive in the minors, but um, it just doesn't feel like there's a lot there. And the problem that you're running into is like, Fetty's going to be a great trade candidate, right? Yeah. Like there's gonna be a lot of teams that are lining up to him. To me, their best trade option is Crochet because he's way closer to free agency than that people realize. There's only three years to go. And, you know, he's basically the same service time that Michael Kopech is. And Kopech has, you know, gotten better, it seems like, in that that late inning role, but the walks are still problematic. You know, I think that's kind of what I look at is it's like, man, if there's anybody that's having a halfway decent season, like you might be able to get something for him. And in the case of Crochet, I think you could really make a huge impact on your roster, right? Like you could, but we have to see, I, th I thought Chris Getz did a, a pretty good job this winter in trying to build at least a more competitive team. It hasn't resulted that way. Mm -hmm. I have a little bit more faith in him now than I did when he got the job, but I do think that there's still a ton of work to do. And I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if even they're surprised by how much there is to go, because this is just not, this hasn't been good. Yeah. As I told Jim and James, I'm putting the over under at four and a half trades between now and the deadline. Mm -hmm. and this is a team on pace to finish 45 at 117. Mike, if they yeah. trade Fetty, if they trade Tommy Pham, if they trade Flexen, if they trade Garrett Crochet, is this team winning 40 games, even with Luis Robert coming back from injury soon? Like, yeah, 
I mean, probably. I hope so. Um, I think it's just, I mean, it's they're they're on pace for 45, right? Like I, I think they are. I mean, I would mention Steven Wilson in that mix too, as a guy that really like that's, you know, relievers are a luxury on a bad team, yeah. right? John and Brady, he's a guy another that, one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think those are guys like really though. I think Wilson is a like Wilson to me, the walk rate is crazy high for him. That's never really been his issue. Um, I think he's a guy that would be of interest to other teams too. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, like it's not going to be good. Like go to the, if you want to go to the games because you want to go see baseball, I encourage you to go to the games to go see baseball, but it's not, I would not anticipate it's going to get much better over the course of the season. You'll hope Jordan leisure can figure it out at the end of games and that Nick Nostrini stops giving up taters. Well, again, Mike will be calling the games in Tucson for the upcoming regional and the NCAA postseason. You can watch those games on ESPN2, ESPN+. Plus. I also think ESPNU, you mentioned uh, some of the broadcasts will be. They'll be starting at 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. Central Time for those games. So definitely check them out. Listen to Mike. And, of course, you can still listen to Mike on Sirius XM and MLB Network Radio and also in the College Sports Channel as well. Mike, this was fantastic. Thank you for entertaining me. I don't have many people to talk college baseball <laughs> with. This was a blast. Thank you so much for coming back on. Well, it's always a pleasure, Josh. And, you know, I'm a big, big uh, supporter of Sox Machine. I'm a, I'm a subscriber myself, and I love talking White Sox baseball even when things aren't going so well. That will do it for this episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. You can subscribe to the Sox Machine Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, such as Spotify and Apple Music. You can also listen to the Sox Machine Podcast on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Machine. If you do listen to us on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. It greatly helps us. You can follow us on social media. We're on all the platforms at Socks Machine. You can follow me at Socks Machine underscore Josh. And if you want full access to all of our coverage of the Chicago White Sox and also the 2024 Major League Baseball Draft, subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash Socks Machine. With monthly plans starting at $5, you get an ad-free version of of both the website and the podcast. Again, full access to all the coverage of the Chicago White Sox from James Fegan and greatly help support us at Sox Machine covering the Chicago White Sox. Again, you can sign up at patreon.com slash Sox Machine. The Sox Machine podcast is a production of SoxMachine.com. You're over all things Chicago White Sox baseball and part of the Blue Wire podcast network. I'm Josh Nelson. Thanks for listening and watching. Everyone is talking about magnesium. It's all you hear about. But why? What do we know about magnesium? Well, magnesium is the number one mineral that 75% of Americans are deficient in. If you are a woman over 35, magnesium will help you rediscover balance, energy, and vitality. Magnesium supports more than 300 enzymatic reactions in your body, including those involved in hormonal balance. From functional medicine doctors to mental well-being and female hormone experts, we all know that magnesium is the one mineral to improve all aspects of well-being and health. But which one? Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers. The trusted choice recommended by leading experts with seven best-absorbed forms of magnesium to ensure your body receives the support it needs for overall well-being. Go to bioptimizers.com balance today and use code BALANCE10 for 10% off. Support your journey to wellness at B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S dot com forward slash balance. Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers, your foundation to optimal health and vitality.